I'm not as think as I smart I am I'm not as think as I smart I am I'm not as think as I thought I might be for that clear anybody to see I'm not as think as I smart I am I'm not as think as I smart Welcome to the Brains Matter podcast This is episode 10 Yes we've made it to number 10 now for the 12th of December 2006 I'm the ordinary guy I'll bring you stories on science curiosities knowledge and anything else that's interesting Today's show, I'll feature stories on strange weather phenomena, the Doppler effect, and bring you some of the latest news in the world of knowledge. And just before I get on with the show, I'm looking for a new icon or avatar for the show. If you're the creative sort, put together something and submit it. Who knows? Your submission may become the new icon for Brains Matter. And a big thank you to everyone who's given positive feedback about previous shows especially the comments on the interview with Michael Feller last week. Keep those emails rolling in. The state of Victoria in Australia, where I live, has been under a bushfire alert for the past couple of weeks. In fact, it's been so bad that when I woke up on the weekend, the air was so hazy that I actually thought it was foggy outside. But in fact, it was the ash and soot in the air from all the bushfires in the state. It managed to blow around and end up in metropolitan Melbourne. The weekend averaged about 40 degrees which is almost 105 Fahrenheit for those who still use that sort of measurement for temperatures. And whether it's from natural weather cycles, or directly or indirectly due to global warming, I can tell you that Eastern Australia is suffering the brunt of whatever it is. This morning, as I went outside to go to work, I noticed that the sun was a strange orange colour, which of course, you can't do on a normal day from all the brightness. But I could this morning, because the pollution and smoke filter a lot of the light away. And I could even see the dark sunspots in the sun. Quite an amazing sight when you normally can't even look at the sun. Did you know that different types of pollution can change the appearance of the sun? Apart from bushfires, volcanic eruptions and dust storms can change the intensity and colour of our nearest star. When the Krakatoa volcano in Indonesia erupted in 1883, Many places around the world reported that the sun appeared blue. It's because more than 25 cubic kilometres, that's right, cubic kilometres, of rock, ash and pumice, which is a porous volcanic rock that originates from magma, and this interferes with the sun's rays that are hitting the earth. So the sun appears various shades of blue and even red. In fact, the painting called The Scream by Edvard Munch showing a blood-red sky and painted in 1893, is purported by researchers to be related to the Krakatoa eruption. Munch said, Suddenly the the sky turned blood-red. I stood there shaking with fear and felt an endless scream passing through nature. And that was in Norway, halfway across the world from Indonesia. Heavy pollution has even changed the colour of raindrops. In March 1935... In the Shetland Islands in the UK, after a heavy thunderstorm, it was reported that the water droplets were a blue-black colour, similar to that of ink. The explanation at the time was pollution, and in New Zealand, on the 29th of October 1929, red rain fell in New Zealand a couple of days after a smoky haze over the South Island. And pollution blocking out the sun and affecting weather patterns was also the primary issue behind the so-called nuclear winter. If an atomic war had started, 
then the amount of pollution in the air due to those types of bombs would probably cause an extended period where the amount of sunlight hitting the Earth would diminish, causing a nuclear winter. And now it's time for today's Brain Teaser. Who won the internet-based World Mayor of the Year Award this year? The answer to this question later in the show. Have you ever wondered why the pitch of an ambulance or police car changes as it drives past you? It's because of something called the Doppler effect. So how does the Doppler effect work? Sound works by creating sound waves in the matter between the object and your ears. Imagine dropping a stone into a pond. The ripples that the stone makes when it hits the water go out in circular waves from where the stone dropped. If the water is perfectly still to start with, the circles would generally be perfect circles around the centre, going outwards. If you were a small insect, about a metre away from the centre, the waves of the water would hit you at fairly equal intervals, so it would seem regular. This is exactly the same as a sound wave reaching you at a given distance. However, if the insect moves towards the central point, then it makes sense that it would hit each wave faster than it would if it was staying still, since it's catching up to the waves and bypassing them faster. In the world of sound, this would increase the pitch. For example, the sound of the ambulance as it comes towards you. The sound waves are actually hitting you faster than if you were staying still and the ambulance was staying still. And if the insect was running away from the central point of the water ripples, then it would take longer for the waves to hit the insect. And in the world of sound, this corresponds to a lowering of the pitch of the sound. For example, the sound of the ambulance as it goes away from you. And what's happening in each of these cases is that the frequency of the waves is either shrunk, which is known as blue shift, or stretched, which is known as red shift. The reason why it's called red or blue shift is because it's exactly the same thing that happens with light. That's how astronomers detect whether an object in space is moving towards us or moving away from us. If the light has a reddish tinge compared to what would be normally expected, then it would indicate that the object is moving away from us, and objects that are blue shifted are moving towards us. This helps astronomers calculate how fast objects are moving away or towards us, and is one of the methods used to figure out how quickly the universe is expanding. time for the answer to today's brain teaser. So who was voted by over 103,000 people to win the World Mayor of the Year award? Previous winners include the Mayor of Tirana and the Mayor of Athens. But this year's winner is John So, the Lord Mayor of Melbourne. That's right, the Lord Mayor of the city I live in. It doesn't come as a surprise to any of the locals. Can you think of the name of your Lord Mayor? No? If you can't, then don't be disappointed. Before John So became the mayor here, the majority of people here probably wouldn't recognise the mayor if they poked them in the eye. But with John So, he's got such a cult following that there was even a song released about him. There are t-shirts with his face on it. And at the Commonwealth Games, during the opening and closing ceremonies, some of the biggest cheers were reserved for him when he took to the podiums. To say he has a cult following is to put it mildly. If you wander around the streets of Melbourne saying, John So, he's my bro, then you'll get nods of agreement and approval, rather than weird looks which you'd otherwise normally expect. But I don't think anyone outside of Melbourne would understand this. So congratulations, John So. And if you want more information, just go to 
www.worldmayor.com. Now it's time for the pin of the week, a new segment where I'll say hello to someone at random who's left a pin on the Frapper map on the link from the webpage. If you want the opportunity for a hello, it's easy to become eligible. Just put down a pin with your name and location into the Frapper map. So today's pin of the week goes to Andres Suve from Estonia. I hope you're enjoying the show, Andres, and I hope I pronounced your name right. Apologies if I didn't. So what's been happening in the world of knowledge lately? Well, there's been some speculation for years about whether there's been life on Mars at some point in the past or not. And that's where we got one of the most common names for aliens, Martians. To support life, it's been thought that a planet would require water to sustain carbon-based life as we know it. And until now, scientists have thought that Mars has been a dry, inhospitable planet There were theories that Mars once held water. Even back in the days of Galileo, it was assumed that the lines they could see on Mars were canals. And you've probably heard some old wives' tales about Martian canals, but it turns out they were just rock formations. In more recent years, there's been speculation that life may have existed on Mars since water could have frozen as ice in the polar regions and water vapour exists in small quantities but nothing in terms of liquid water, which would be essential for life. It turns out that the images taken by NASA's Mars Global Surveyor spacecraft has implied that Mars, at least in the past, did actually have liquid water at one point in time. Scientists studying the surveyor's findings have determined that changes in the walls of a couple of Martian craters were caused by the flow of water, similar to the way water erosion works on land here on Earth. They did this by comparing images of the surface taken seven years apart and found around 20 new craters in that time caused by space debris as well as trickling water on the walls of the craters. Michael Mayer, lead scientist for NASA's Mars Exploration Program, said that these observations give the strongest evidence to date that water still flows occasionally on the surface of Mars. Given that liquid water isn't sustainable on the surface, it would either freeze or evaporate and still doesn't have much hope for Earth-like life to exist on Mars. If you're wondering how water-based erosion type effects are apparent, even though liquid water can't continue to exist on Mars, scientists say that what happens is that the water exists long enough for it to transport some debris down the side of a slope before freezing or evaporating. This doesn't mean that water can't exist at all on Mars. There may be some inside craters, for example, but the question still remains. Some evidence points to the fact that Mars used to have water. Where did it come from? And where did it go? Where is the current water coming from, and how abundant is it? Those questions and more to be hopefully answered by a friendly space scientist over the next few decades. Scientists from the European Arctic Research Body DAMICALS, which stands for Developing Arctic Modelling and Observing Capabilities for Long-Term Environmental Studies, that's a mouthful, have predicted, with physics and modelling, that the Arctic Ocean's ice field would totally melt away by the year 2080 due to global warming. This would have an effect not just on the Arctic, but a ripple effect on the whole food chain. So it wouldn't just be the polar bears who'd suffer from it. At the same time, a group of European institutes studied the climate in the region between France, Hungary, 
Italy and Germany between March 2003 and August 2006 to reconstruct the climate in that region over the last 1,000 years. What they found was that the European Alpine region is going through its warmest period in 1,300 years. Reinhard Baum, a climatologist at Austria's Central Institute for Meteorology and Geodynamics, stated that the current warm period in the Alps began in the 1980s and predicts that it will get warmer in the future. The Australian government, along with many other Western governments, have been opposing therapeutic cloning research. However, last week, the Australian House of Representatives passed a bill allowing scientists to carry out therapeutic cloning research, despite the opposition of right-to-life groups and some religious leaders. Many senior politicians, including their Prime Minister, opposed the bill, but in the end, they didn't get their way. If you're wondering what therapeutic cloning is, it basically means that the embryos can be created for the purpose of harvesting stem cells. These embryos are then destroyed after 14 days. Those opposing this type of research claim that the value of the research is questionable and that using the cells for harvesting is immoral and also claim that the destruction of the cells is tantamount to murder. What one needs to keep in mind though is that the embryos that are currently used in research are destroyed after 14 days regardless of whether they are used to obtain stem cells or not. Scientists are hailing this decision as the right one and will aid in the research battle against debilitating diseases such as Parkinson's disease, diabetes, cancer and motor neuron disease. in Britain is currently trying to get permission to transplant stem cells into the brains of stroke patients. The company Reneuron has evidence showing that undertaking such a procedure could possibly regenerate cells that have been damaged by a stroke. Stem cells are cells that can turn into any other type of cell. Adult cells can only multiply into the type of cell that they already are. For example, Muscle cells can only give rise to muscle cells. Blood cells in the bone marrow can only give rise to blood cells, and so on. But stem cells can give rise to any type of cell, and there's a lot of research going on in this area. However, as I mentioned just before, there's a lot of misconception around what it truly means, perhaps not helped by people's understanding of science based on Hollywood movies, so there's a lot of opposition to it. According to Re Neuron's head of stem cell discovery, Dr. Eric Milgen, when stem cells were injected into the brains of rats who had a stroke induced, their movement recovered, and tests showed that blood flow and brain activity to the damaged areas were restored. Up until recently, it was thought that damage to the brain was irreversible. This type of research indicates that there are medical ways to resolve this problem. A noite que cobre o beijo, o lençol que cobre o desejo E sobre nós It turns out that MRIs, or magnetic resonance imaging, can reveal changes in the brain that may indicate the onset of schizophrenia in some people. By tracking the changes in these images, along with the assessments that are already used today, detecting the onset of the problem can be aided. Research was done over the course of 10 years, taking MRI scans of each of the subjects a year and a half apart. They discovered that some physical changes in the brain corresponded to the exhibition of raised anxiety levels up to two years before the onset of full psychosis. The group was selected based on predictions that they were all in a high risk group for developing schizophrenia and the statistics for the group showed that around 13% would develop their condition. However, using the MRI method, the predictive level increased to 60%, which still isn't perfect, 
but it's definitely a step in the right path and almost quadruple the effectiveness of the current methods. The Japanese Hinori spacecraft, launched by the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency back in September, has returned some amazing pictures of many of the sun's solar features. The Hinori's primary purpose was to study solar flares, which are huge fiery eruptions from the surface of the sun. The craft takes continuous observations in the ultraviolet, X-ray and optical sections of the electromagnetic spectrum in the hope of discovering something new. Researchers want to find out what triggers solar flares. Solar flares can disrupt communications on Earth, pose a hazard to astronauts and they hurl particles and radiation towards the Earth. And thank you once again for listening to the Brains Matter podcast for the 12th of December 2006. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions, please drop me an email at mail at brainsmatter.com or leave a comment on this episode's show notes at www.brainsmatter.com and make sure you let me know where you're from and how you found the podcast. You can find all the older podcasts on the Brains Matter site. Just click on the podcast link on the right-hand side. There's also a Frapper Map link on the right-hand side of the website in the blog roll section. Just click on that and put in a pin to show where you live. If you enjoy the show, feel free to donate via PayPal through the links on the website and it'll allow me to continue to produce the show and help out a lot in terms of internet and other costs. Music on today's show comes courtesy of Podsafe Audio and you can find the podcast by doing a search within iTunes or by subscribing manually by clicking one of the links on the website. Please leave comments and vote for the podcast in iTunes and Podcast Alley. If you already voted last month, be sure to vote this month as well. And thanks to Wes and Roval in Australia for the following joke. A man was driving in his car across the countryside when he looked up towards a small hill and in amongst the wheat he could see a farmer standing there perfectly still. He thought this was odd, but just kept on driving. That evening, he was coming back the other way, and he saw the same guy, standing in the same field, staying perfectly still. This made him wonder, so he stopped the car, got out, and walked up to the farmer. When he got up to him, he said, "Um, Excuse me, I hope I'm not disturbing you, but would you mind telling me what you're doing here? Sure thing, the farmer said. I'm trying to win a Nobel Prize. The man was baffled. How do you plan on winning a Nobel Prize by standing perfectly still on your land? Well, the farmer replied, I'm told that they award the Nobel Prize to someone who's outstanding in his field. Thanks for that, Wes. Looks like your joke was a bit of a hit. I'll leave you with a quote from Hugh MacLeod. The old ways are dead, and you need people around you who concur. That means hang out more with the creative people, the freaks, the real visionaries, than you're already doing. Thinking more about what their needs are and responding accordingly. Avoid the dullards. Avoid the folk who play it safe. They can't help you anymore. Their stability model no longer offers that much stability. They are extinct. They are extinction. I hope you enjoyed the show. Bye for now. 
I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I thought I might be for that's clear anybody to see. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I clever I would be. I'm not half as clever as me.